And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, ever returning good brother, making his triumphant return after Discord shenanigans marred the last time we did this. <laughs> <laughs> and cr creator, uh, creator of Dominion Fall of the House of Saul, which is, I believe, cur currently in production of its second volume. Yes. The one and only Dr. Baron Bell. How are you doing today, man? Hey, man, I'm great. Good to be back. As my chiropractor often says, glad to see you're back. <laughs> Gotta love those little jokes. Gotta mm -hmm. love them. Yep. Um, I'm here for them. So... Uh, first, first off, congrats on um, get on getting on getting Dominion out. Thank you, thank mm -hmm. you. I really appreciate that. Um, now, now, um, we had talked we had talked a bit about a, about a, a lot a lot of the characterization um, within within it. Um, yes, but one th one thing that I'm a, that I'm a bit that I'm a bit curious about is. What what were some what what do you what would you say were some of the learning experiences you had um, in the aftermath of developing the first volume? Because I'm always curious about the postmortems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a you know that's a really good question. You're the first person to actually ask me that. Mm -hmm. um, the the postmortem uh, is I guess you know when you go through a process of developing something for the first time you make a lot of mistakes but you find out a lot about your process as well um i did find out that our process was pretty streamlined as far as it, as far as it goes we we pr pretty much completed um you know a 28 page book within i would say total work time would have been probably two maybe two and a half months and then the time period after that was just um you know uh marketing and um trying to get the book launched so i, I learned that our, our process was pretty streamlined mm -hmm. um and uh you know i learned just some other things just about marketing in general that uh is definitely going to help us move forward with our next book uh you know that we're hopefully trying to get out uh by Christmas, uh, if not um, the the first couple of weeks of January. Yep. And now, with, now, um, with that with that kind of thing in 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 mind, so like what like the when I saw what I saw the first volume, very very much felt like a kind. Okay, Kind of in kind of a setting the stage kind of thing. The as as much as I don't want to be always pretentious, just mostly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Please, by all means. Look, I do raise I do raise my pinky when drinking tea. All right. Um, <laughs> the vibe that the vibe that I get out of the first volume is akin to an overture. You know, set, yes. you know, setting the stage. Yes. Which absolutely. I think I can get away with that in this case, since we are dealing with a space opera. Yes. And would it be fair to say that the focus for Volume Two will be on the will be on exp be on expanding that expanding that o expanding that overture, and also taking a look at the other side of the coin. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, those two things, I think. Are going to be very um, important in book two mm -hmm. um, because you know we just introduced uh, you know for those of you guys who don't know Dominion is a um, a sci-fi uh, uh, kind of a rendition of the book of First uh, Samuel in the Bible, mm -hmm. uh, telling the story about the the rise of King Saul or actually the fall of King Saul. Uh, maybe we'll talk about the rise later, but. Um, it's really just introducing his family, 
you know, just we we take some creative license and artistic liberty because this is not a, a word for word retelling because of course this is set in space and our main characters are all anthropomorphic creatures. And so uh, I always say it's Star Wars meets Narnia. Mm -hmm. um, and so the first book was really just, you know, introducing the characters. This is the, 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 the cast of characters uh, and the conflict. Um, we insinuate the antagonist, but we don't show them. Um, and so book two is about, okay, showing the antagonist um, expanding the world actually a lot because there's going to be a massive like space battle mm -hmm. um, and introducing other characters that we haven't seen uh, in book one. Yeah. And one of the, one of the things that one of the things that I think um, definitely helps definitely helps in its in its favor. When it comes to how mm -hmm. when it comes to how the book was pre was presented is, I've seen I've seen my fair share of books that were definitely um, biblically inspired o over the years, and mm -hmm. there is one trap that a lot of that a lot of them fall into, mm -hmm. and that is put and that is putting in putting in by putting in scripture quotes, um, just not a, not as not as a reflection of what's going to be ha what's going to be happening in that story but just to show right this just to show this is a christian story which yeah i don't know about you but whenever i see that kind of thing i always cringe because it takes me out of the moment i totally get that and and i i hate that i absolutely hate that mm -hmm. um the thing we do in dominion is we weave some of the actual biblical uh, uh narrative into the script mm -hmm. so you will have a character like samuel saying hey you know you have uh disappointed me and 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 the almighty and so the kingdom is going to be stripped from you this is paraphrasing uh in some in some places and then even word for word in others we may re we may replace a word or two to fit our our world but in general that's that's how we kind of you know kind of honor the source material mm -hmm by just putting some you know because i mean we are not necessarily going word for word but we are going scenario for scenario so it's like we are referencing certain scenarios going along a timeline uh and but we're actually altering and enhancing some of those scenarios by adding our storyline uh, story points to it yeah and the big now, now, obvious. I th maybe it's just me, but I th I think a I think a lot of times when when um when those sort of quotes are bla are blatantly used, it almost this might seem a bit harsh, but it don't it almost se it almost seems like in a lot of the cases that fail this particular test, they're doing mm -hmm. it to um to give off the veneer of we of we're high we're we're high class fiction. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> high class fiction. Um, <laughs> I like that. And I do, I do want to make clear. I have no, I have no problem with, with say, a, with say a quote from a a philosopher or a quote from scripture or the like. Yeah. At the st at the start of yeah. a particular story. Yeah. With one catch, mm -hmm. it has to tie. It has to. It has to kind. Of, it has to hint at what's a, a major theme within the story or what the story is. Yeah. What the story is about. Um. Yeah. Yeah. As. Because because of the fact that I wanted to, I wanted to see a good a good trashy wanted to rewatch a good trashy movie over the weekend I ended up watching the old Caligula. Um, yeah. The, okay. The one the one with the one with McDowell and a and a Peter O'Toole who is clear yeah. who is clearly drunk as a fish. <laughs> <laughs> um, Man, that Caligula was a was a character though, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And at the start of that movie. Is a, is a um is the quote of, what should it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? Yeah, 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 and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, well, you know, well, you know this, you know the story when it comes to Cal when it comes to Caligula, and I found yeah, out that the yeah. um that the whorehouse ship in that in that uh, movie was at the time the most expensive prop ever made. Oh what? Whoa! I didn't know that. Because they they literally had to build the thing indoors. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
How crazy oh. is that? Yeah, it's now. But you know, I, I I agree with you. I agree with you that respect, though. I mean, I like the way. Um, and even when it doesn't, even when it's not a biblical quote, mm -hmm. I love it when I see a, a quote that ties into the narrative that you know uh, that it's preceding. Like, um, remember the show The Wire? Yeah, The Wire used to do that. At the beginning of an episode, you may have like, um, you know, like a. a you know, Tupac lyric, or you would have, you know, like a Sun Tzu, you know, um, quote or just mm -hmm. something that would tie directly into what, what is preceding. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I like, I like it when you do that. And so, yeah, it, it has to be relevant if you're going to use it, you know what I'm saying? And so, uh, I, I'm not all, I'm not about throwing away opportunities, Yeah. you know what I'm saying? So it's like, if, if, if I'm going to use it, it has to, it has to fit. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, like I said, we weave uh, scripture into the the dialogue of some of these characters, like not always every once in a while. But if it's like a pivotal moment, like that moment where Samuel tells uh, uh, Saul that the kingdom is being stripped from him and given to one of his neighbors, a man who is better than you, a man after God's own heart or the almighty's own heart. Mm -hmm. And that's really, that's exactly what he said, but that fits the narrative. Yeah. And so this is the, the beginning. We start book one with the beginning of the end of King Saul's kingdom of, of mm -hmm. King Saul's dominion over dominion. Yeah. And when it, when it's, um, that brings me to, to some, to something I'm curious about when, when you're right, when it came to the script writing, Mm -hmm. Was it was it a case where you where you were going you're going through verses and looking at them saying how can how can I reword this so it maintains the same spirit but fits within what characters would actually say because mm -hmm. like with like with a lot of um a lot of scripture a lot of scripture and a lot of a lot of holy books mm -hmm. and a, and a lot of cla a lot of um classical um literature as a whole. Mm -hmm. It is not. It is, and I and I want to make clear. I'm not. I'm not making this as some sort as some sort of criticism. It's just a um, fact. They're not written in the way that people actually talk. Yeah. Oh. I get you. I get you. Yeah. Um. When it comes down to you know, it's funny because um, there are several different ways to think about the Bible. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can think of it in terms of, oh, King James, thus the thou type situation. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Which makes it very difficult to read. I mean, it's almost like you're reading Shakespeare. You know, you might as well be reading Shakespeare if you're going to read the early King James Bible because of, it was it was written around the same time. It's funny you mention that kind of thing because a few years ago I wrote, I wrote a piece on um, Zemeckis' take on A Christmas Carol. Mm -hmm. that was trying to be as close to the original book as possible. Mm -hmm. But here's where you run into a problem. The kind of English that was used 400 years ago is not the is not going to be the English that people that people use now nowadays. Exactly. And I had, I had said because because of the fact that it's trying to replicate a older an older style of English without without trying to strike a balance you're mm -hmm. gonna have a lot of kids watching the movie saying, "What the hell did he just say?" Yeah, 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 exactly. That's my point. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't make any sense. You, it, you, you kind of shoot yourself in the foot if you're trying to really attract an audience, but you, you, you lose them in the dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, and so my thing is, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna take a, a, a translation of the the bible that is much more um you know um easy to kind of process um usually i'm going with like um uh you know uh, new american standard or new new international version there's mm -hmm. two two i mean they're they're closer to the actual translation of the the original biblical text written in hebrew hebrew mm -hmm. um at the old testament and then, um, you know, but it's much more modern. Yeah. And so then I would take that and then I would 
put it through the Dominion machine <laughs> and then spit out whatever it's going to say, yeah. which is kind of close. But you know, you change a couple of things here to fit the the world I'm trying to create. Mm -hmm. So it it's got to it's got to fit. It's got to flow. Um, I have another co-writer. His name is uh, Daniel Hancock, who actually takes another look after I've done all of my research and all of my writing, and then he. He's a script writer, so he mm -hmm. he actually goes through and, and puts on a polish and spin and makes sure that there are Easter eggs and connections to to upcoming storylines. Mm -hmm. And so uh yeah, and then we 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 put it down. Although given that kind of name, I have to I have to ask the obvious. Does he have a giant signature? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> You're funny. Funny man. <laughs> look, I'm look, I'm pretty sure I'm if I'm if I'm the first person to make that joke, I am going to be very disappointed. Yeah, I gotta ask him about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure he's had. I'm pretty sure he's had that. I'm pretty sure he's had that question a lot. The same. The same yeah. way that's. Um. The same way that pe that people pe people keep making tall jokes about me. Well, yeah, yeah. So, the, so funny. Um. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned translation because mm -hmm. look. I'm of the opinion that translators have to have 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 to play double duty as writers as much as the, as much as they're doing translation, sure. because le because when you're the when you're dealing with languages, especially ones that aren't using even especially ones that aren't using the characters that we're familiar with, mm -hmm. um, if you try and do literal translations, you're just you're gonna end up with something worse. Yeah. Um, like I, I've I've known people who've translated from um, books from Russian and German or uh, Japanese mm -hmm. to um, English, and mm -hmm. even after and even after the translation is done, then they have to re rewrite what they just what they just translated in order to have it mm -hmm. make se make sense. And even mm -hmm. even something like German has that kind of issue. Like I I saw I saw once a a um or a what would be a literal translation of um, some of Kafka's work. Mm, okay. And the, prob the problem is sentence structuring in German doesn't quite work the same way it does in English, even though yeah. German is one of the languages that is a contributor to modern English, which is why it's easier to learn German than other languages. Yeah. But if you were to read it straight with the way sentence structure works in German compared to English, you'd see mm -hmm. a lot of run-on sentences. Well, of course, mm -hmm. of course. I mean, you know, we actually just uh, finished uh, two translations of Dominion. We put mm -hmm. one in Spanish and one in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. And we had to go through that process of, OK, you know, we had a, a you know native speaker mm -hmm. who actually wrote it. And then we had a couple of other people read it to make sure that the spirit got across correctly. And um, and they did a really good job. It's a process, though. It, mm -hmm. it, it takes a lot of thought and, um, you know, a lot of back and forth yeah. between me and the translator and, and all of that. So you, you're absolutely right. Absolutely right about that. Yeah. Um, and when it comes when it comes to the back and forth between you and Han between you and Hancock, were, th mm -hmm. were there um, was it a mostly smooth instance or were, or were there any issues where he where he looked at? A initial draft and then sent and then sent it back saying do it do it do it again bell well you know it's actually a uh, vice versa because i actually do all of the initial writing mm -hmm. um you know i come up with the treatment i come up with the script and i do an initial pass on dialogue hancock will come in and he's actually like um the the scalpel who will go in and 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 tweak little things here and there? Mm -hmm. um, he he makes those, like I said, those connections, those Easter eggs that will be um, you know seen in in, in future storylines. He has like the he has like the thousand feet view of the whole like three book story initial or actually the all nine books that we're going to be doing mm -hmm. for this kind of round. And then of course he wants to make those connections, and then he'll come in um with with his precision to make sure that certain lines are done right he's he's a he's a script writer he's a screenwriter so you know he knows how to to make things sound good as far as they go i mean I, i'm in pretty good you know what i'm saying i mean i'm very good at constructing and world building and to some degree you know uh, interpersonal dialogue but but 
you know, Hancock is great, man. He he goes in and he really he's that surgeon. Mm -hmm. And one of the, one of the other things that I that I did that I did note is when it came to pan when it came to panel composition, mm -hmm. um, like there's there are some there are some comp there are some people there are some people who for who format their sequential their sequential art with a very um structured sort sort of mm -hmm. sort of paneling setup like for ex I know I know it's I know it's got I know it's gotten it's um it's fl it's flack from its creator o over the years although the creator in question doesn't like anything so but mm -hmm. look at Watchmen for instance Watchmen yeah I knew that's where you were going <laughs> I knew that's look, where you were going look um Alan Alan Moore isn't wrong when he, when he says that people learn the the wrong lessons from Watchmen. The mm -hmm. problem is um Alan Alan Moore is is um I I'd, com I'd, I'd compare him I compare him to Harlan Ellison in terms of his cr in terms of his curmudgery, but um yeah. Ellison had good reasons for what for why he was for why he was so grouchy and um mm -hmm. and he and he outright and he would outright admit that he he was a cantankerous man. Um, <laughs> a lot of it came from the passion that he had for science fiction, and yeah. also something that um his, something that his colleague Isaac Asimov had said that he has an he suffers from an inability to suffer fools gladly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, probably, which is why it's a miracle that he managed to get along for five seconds with Gene Roddenberry without wanting to choke him. Um, <laughs> but Watchmen has a very, even though it, even though it differs from it at times, it tries to stick as close to a three by three panel setup as much as it can. Yeah. And yeah, with, um, with some, with something like, th with something like, um, Dominion, mm -hmm. I'd say a, a lot of, t a lot of times there's a very, there's a very rule of three kind of kind of kind of panel setup with each page. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, some panels have more frames than others. Yeah, but it does it does feel like there are three beats to to every page. Was that was that one of the uh, was that something that you kind of settled on, or was it something that you decided on early on that? I, I think that you know what, and that's a good. I mean, I'm glad you asked that question because. Mm -hmm. Um, when it comes to to panel layout, um, I'm not necessarily thinking about the layout, but I'm thinking about how is the person's eye traveling across the page, mm -hmm. um, and how uh, not just with um, the actual juxtaposition of a panel, but also the color. Uh, what kind of mood am I setting for this page? And can I communicate that? Like, okay, for instance, there's this one panel um, early on mm -hmm. uh, after Saul, uh, he's having a nightmare. Uh, he's remembering the, the moment that he lost the kingdom. And then on the next page, you know, when Samuel walks away, there's this, this one panel where it's like an overhead view of his bedchamber and he's very, very sad, saying, "Come back, Samuel." Mm -hmm. uh, and the the so color to me was very, very important because you go from kind of like a desaturated color because it's a flashback to then um, a panel, uh, a, a page with uh, is it three panels probably, mm -hmm. if that. Yeah, I think it's three panels, and then you have the, a huge, gigantic panel, so two small panels and one big panel on the bottom with the overhead of the bedchamber, but it's it's morning time, so you have these uh, very, very morning colors, uh, the kind of purple and uh, amber kind of washing into the room. And so I wanted to have a, uh, this, I wanted it to feel a certain way. I wanted, and uh, one of the things that, one of the best compliments that I've been given from a lot of people, even authors, is that I actually made them feel something other than uh, uh, that Saul is this kind of a evil antagonist. 
uh, yeah, Saul has a reputation for, for being evil. Of course, he tried to kill David. He tried to kill his son. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's, uh, he's, he, he, he majors in hubris, but he was still a, uh, he's still a man who has emotions. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a key to that. But to answer your question about just the, the, the panel layout, it really isn't about that type of structure. It's about feeling. How do I feel? Yeah. I, I I err on the side of of less panels on the page than more. So that's where you know uh, uh, you know Alan Moore and I will will differ a little bit. I won't have like that three by three type of a, a grid layout on my page. I'll just you know I, I would I would prefer to have less panels. So if I could have like two panels or three panels and tell the same story, that's great. If I have to add more pages, I go over that with the publisher to see, okay, is it in the budget to do that? And then we just do it. I, I mean, as long as it's getting the thought across, I mean, I, I can recall there was a time, a moment where I'm like, um, uh, there's this one scene in, in the, um, uh, I guess you would call it like the war room in the mm -hmm. castle yeah. where you have like the king and, and all of his uh, generals around this big gigantic a holographic screen and and his son comes in and he basically humiliates his son in front of everybody mm -hmm. and then his son walks out and initially in the script it cuts to the hangar where he talks to his mother but i was like well it that cuts that's going too fast i need to slow i need to slow this down a little bit because you know how would you feel if your father just humiliated you and so, especially if you're seeking his approval, and so the next page, I have a four panel set up uh, for um, horizontal panels. And then in each panel is a, uh, it's like a passage of time. It's like a sequential passage of time where Jonathan is walking out of the council chamber from the background to the foreground. By the bottom panel, he's up in the foreground. He, he, he is turned around and the door is basically slam shut and so now he's kind of feeling alone mm -hmm. and discouraged but there's no words on that page no no words i didn't need any words to communicate that and so i added the page mm -hmm. because i'm like i need that we need to slow this down a little bit yeah um and i de i've i've definitely seen comics that um that can go that can go a little bit too a little bit too quickly and I can, and especially with the first issue, there's an easy temptation to go to go to go at that speed because you're trying you're trying to get as much stuff established before you get before you get into the real work. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the pro the problem with the problem when so when somebody does that, and this is not just something tied to comics. This happens in fi in all sort in all sorts of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Um. You end up you end up with an issue where the where um you're basically pushing somebody at the deep end of the pool and and the only instructions you're giving them is swim, damn it. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I think we have a responsibility mm -hmm. as as storytellers mm -hmm. to number one be authentic. Um, but number two, try to tell the best story that you can without overwhelming your audience, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of people don't even know the story of Saul. They don't even, they've never read the Bible before. A lot of people, you know, and, and so to them, this is a, this is a brand new story. And so I can't overwhelm or, or I can't overwhelm them with information. And then I can't assume either. Cause I think that's where a, a lot of authors, especially if they're, they're, they're doing something that uh, is referencing the Bible, they're assuming that people know the Bible or yep. know these stories or know, well, I'm coming at it from the opposite direction. I'm coming at it from just a pr pure story uh, standpoint that is introducing even the n complete ignorant person to the Bible to just a story. If, if uh, some people are familiar with the story, that's great. It's a plus, it's a bonus. Mm -hmm. If they're not, they're not going to get lost because I'm just telling a story. Yep. And that that I think that I think is going to be it's is going to be the ultimate strength in this. And I do want to I do want to make clear that 
that particular trap is not limited to just the Bible. Any sort of yeah. any sort of any sort of story any sort of story that's being to- that's being told in a diff- in a diff- in any kind of interpretation um that's mm-hmm. when that story is already within the pu- within the public mythology for lack of a better term mm-hmm. yeah can have can have this problem there's the there's the mindset that like if i if i was to if i was to do a take on say Alice in Wonderland okay you know, through the looking glass and all that Mm-hmm. I even with that, I can't just assume that people know the know the story because the True. because the obvious question I I can ask is, okay, which okay, which version do they know? Do they know that yeah. weird version that came that came out of Czechoslovakia? Do yeah, they know, yeah, do they yeah, know yeah, the original yeah. book? Do they know True. the Do they know the God help them if if they know the anime? Yes, <laughs> that, yes that is a thing. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, Miyuki Chan in Wonderland. It's uh, okay weird. Um, <laughs> I, th- I have to look that up. Um, do do they know the Burton version? My sympathies if that's the case, if that's how you would, you can introduce the Alice in Wonderland. Um, yeah. Or 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 do or do they know the do they know the old Disney Renaissance um, era, era one? Mm-hmm. Like, and each of and each of those have their own little quirks. And yeah, obviously the obviously the um. One that I would hypothetically do in this situation would have its own quirks as well, mm-hmm. and I th- and that and that's why the the point is is when it comes to that it's it's it could be it could easily be it could easily be assumed that some that somebody has re- that somebody has read the Bible, but mm-hmm. at the same t- at the same time there's a difference between there's a difference between reading. The Bible as a whole, and reading and reading and focusing on individual books. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Because I mean, listen, I mean, I would say, arguably, if you're an American, most people know the story of David and Goliath, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, I mean, it's a it's been turned into a trope. You know, what I'm saying Star Wars used it. You know, what I'm saying Luke taking on the Death Star. It's a trope. Okay. Yeah. Most people, the, most the people phrase, can. The phrase "David versus Goliath" is a pejorative in and of itself. Well, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. And, and so pe- it has been co-opted and put into our our mainstream culture. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, it's like most people don't know what preceded it, and this is why I wrote Dominion the way I wrote it, because mm-hmm. I could have easily jumped to David and Goliath, but to me. That's absolutely low hanging fruit. I mean, that fruit is on the ground and rotten. But you know, there's much more uh, rich storytelling and mining of the story of Saul. Saul, King Saul, is a cautionary tale. Mm-hmm. It's a cautionary tale. It's a tale of hubris. It's a tale of, of um, you know, uh, just uh, you know, a power. Uh, how power corrupts. Yeah. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's King Saul. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And so, but that's that's where I started. That's the surface. You have to dig deeper to see, okay, who was this person? He was a man. He wasn't just this uh, this, uh, this caricature that has been created over the years. Uh, you know, if, if anybody, you know, has ever you know, had read a little, you know, you know, you know how they have those little children's Bibles and they have mm-hmm. like these pictures. <laughs> yeah. I, I had, I had one of those as a little kid. Yeah. You would see a picture of King Saul throwing a spear over David's head or something like mm-hmm. that. And it's like, okay, if that's all you know about Saul, you really don't know this dude. He, he has a lot more rich story behind him. Uh, and in several points in times where he almost, you could almost see him reaching over, changing, and in 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 seeking redemption and actually changing, because there were those points he was a man. So mm-hmm. you know he 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 made mistakes, and then he when he got caught out and said, "Oh, I made a mistake. I'm sorry." He said, "He said I'm sorry a lot of times, but he really, it really did he mean it? I don't know. That's and that's the that's where I like to to be in that I don't know space." That's where you. That's where magic can happen, you know. And the I'm reminded of I'm reminded of something that my that my mentor said a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was he 
he was he was being semi facetious because that was how, that was how he operated, which mm-hmm. probably explains how I turned out. Um, <laughs> but he said, Dra- "Dragons do not make for good villains." Mm-hmm. And a long for a long time I, for a long time I didn't I didn't quite understand what he I didn't quite understand what he meant because I was thinking, mm-hmm. well, Smog is, Smog is the villain in the Hobbit, so wh- so. Yeah. So yeah. why is that not why is that not the why is that not mm-hmm. the case? Um mm-hmm. and and of and of course and of course there's the all-encompassing evil that that is that is um Sauron in um in Lord of the yeah, Rings. Yeah, Lord of the Rings, yeah. But it wasn't until years later that I figured out what he, what he meant. Mm-hmm. He wasn't referring to dragons literally. He was referring yeah. to the uh, to the idea of this Impo- impossible, unstoppable for, um, force of nature. Because mm-hmm. if you, because if you if you think about it, the dr- the reason dragons are called dragons is because people believe that it's impossible to beat them. Yeah, yeah. Which is why you have so many stories of heroes beating them. Yeah, yeah. Um, with. With and us- and usually beat usually beating them through some sort of unorthodox means, whether it be Hercules yeah. against the Hydra, um, yeah, 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 Su- yeah. Um, Suzano Suzano O against um, Orochi no Orochi, in mm-hmm. or um, or e- or even even the uh, dr- even the dragon and um, I believe it was I believe it was Saint Michael. I can't I can't remember. It's been a long time since I read that story. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I can't remember who it was, but yeah, I know what, I know what you're referring to. Mm-hmm. I think I think you know this is for that very the very thing you just said about dragons. Mm-hmm. If you flip it on the other side, I think that's why uh, Superman is not as as popular as Batman. Um, if you have kind of like something that is seemingly, you know, omnipotent in a way, or seemingly all powerful or mighty, and it's very extremely difficult to beat, mm-hmm. um, or if you see like Superman, who I mean, listen, arguably there there have been many many kind of speculations as far as how powerful is superman i see them everywhere I mean, superman people written... is the is the poster child for power creep yeah 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 exactly and people have written dissertations about mm-hmm. this like uh, you know, how powerful who who what is superman what is his significance okay yeah they throw they throw in these um kind of minor okay uh kryptonite can kill him or if he has no exposure to the sun they've had to over the years figure out ways to try to kill him you know and, what i'm saying and so i mean it's like that just shows you it's like this this it, just the ideal of superman that makes what, mm-hmm. it too easy he's not the mm-hmm. best hero to put on a hero's journey yeah yeah the um in fact i, I remember i remember professor geek and a few others and by the way professor geek is a very is a um very good Person when it comes to dice when it comes to dissecting the mythology of superheroes, yeah. Um, but one one of the things one of the things that he had that he had said is is especially is that a character like Superman does not does not work with is me, is meant to be is meant to be the ideal, not yeah. to the uh, not the not the journey itself. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's the reason why when when some Somebody once asked me what my favorite what my favorite um, Superman movie was, and mm-hmm. even if it's a bit of Quest a for mix, peace. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I should I should put you in the I should lock you in the corner for that insinuation. <laughs> okay, okay, what about, I'll, what about, okay, what about Richard Pryor, right? Richard Pryor, you come on, man, come on. <laughs> okay, I'll. Um, you think? No, just wait. Pryor, Pryor just was wait. in three, and while I, while I love Richard Pryor to death, um. I didn't particularly care f- care for that, but no, mm-hmm. the f- no the film the film that I the film that I think at the very least ha- at the very least did the most with that with that kind of character mm-hmm. was um, Superman Returns. Okay, which is saying something because Brian Singer is an incredibly mediocre director. Mm-hmm. But the reason the reason why the reason why that one stuck with me was because of the theme that it had. Okay. That 
Um, it's kind of it's kind of a spin on the on the theme that was sort of touched on in The Dark Knight Returns, mm-hmm. but in this case, you have the idea of Superman as a post religious Christ figure. Okay. Um, yeah, I see that. The the I'd say a, I'd say a sec I'd say a second place, even though its animated adaptation wasn't qu- was to the, to um adaptations that are ca- that are kind of tied for second place, even though one of them wasn't as good as I would have liked was um All Star Superman. Which mm-hmm. ended up winning an Eisner Award that year. Yeah, that's um, when he was depowered, right? Um, the whole the whole idea, one of the main ideas with um, that one, was effectively tr- effectively putting Superman through a kind of twelve labors of Hercules, mm-hmm. um, because because of the fa- because of the fact that he the storyline was that he had take he had taken in way too much solar radiation and was mm-hmm. and was on a sh- and was going to be dying yeah um the other one which I, which i which i liked as a nice um response to the to the grittier end of superheroes that ha- that happened throughout the 90s i.e. the dark age was um superman mm-hmm. versus the elite okay which that was an adaptation of a story in the comics called "What's So Funny About Truth, Justice, and the American Way." Mm-hmm. Um, and it was it was meant to it was essentially meant to be a response to the, to to um to this notion of were classical superheroes too t- too tame for the modern age. Um, mm-hmm. Batman had a similar thing with Nightfall. In fact, the writer of that outright asked. Is our character too tame for the '90s? Hmm. And Interesting. Azrael was designed as as kind of one half of that answer. Like, right. okay, okay, if okay, if everybody wa- if everybody wants that kind of violence in in the superhero, here's an example of that. And they showed mm-hmm. the they showed both sides of the coin on that. Right. Um. So, but when it comes, but when it comes to ha- when it comes even. But when it comes to having an, having some sort of overpowered character, I I don't think that it's impossible to do, to do it, but mm-hmm. you have to work you have to work a, you have to work a different angle. Mm-hmm. Um, for, well, I mean, if you look mm-hmm. if you look at okay, if you look mm-hmm. at um, the Incredible Hulk, yeah, okay, the Incredible Hulk, he probably is immortal, right? More more than likely. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I mean. You can try to kill him, but you never can. Yeah. You can subdue him, mm-hmm. but you can't really kill him. But the thing that makes the Incredible Hulk work is that flaw. Is is this this is this flaw that he's not? He's more of a curse than a blessing. Mm-hmm. He's more of Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde than anything else. Yeah. And he's something that is not. He's not wanted. Uh, Bruce Banner doesn't want. To be the Hulk, and he definitely doesn't want to be the Hulk twenty four seven. You know what I'm saying? And so that is what makes the Hulk interesting. Mm-hmm. Is he is he an overpowered character? Yeah, but they've done so many really great things with him. In that, it just makes him interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, I would read a, a a Hulk book before I read a, a you know Superman book. Sorry, uh, DC fans. You know, I mean, because Superman is just boring. You know what I'm saying? I mean, how many times can you retell the story of him, you know, leaving Krypton and crash landing into Earth? After that, I mean, that was the that was the best story you had for him. the the funny The funny thing that I find when it comes to when it comes to a character like Superman is, it's the characters are. I find the care. I find the. I find other characters within the Superman universe more interesting than him yeah like like i've 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 long been i i've long been a fan of power girl yeah even though even though her origin story is is a case of throwing darts at a dartboard um Mm -hmm. most none of them ever really sticking Mm -hmm. um but it's because it's due to with it's due to the fact that even with the amount of powers that you have with Power Girl or even with um, Sewer Girl, um, that their the focus when it comes to a lot of their stories is more mundane, mm-hmm. largely because they've had writers who understand that 
we can't we can't do the whole sewer power fight with some with somebody who's that powerful. Um, yeah. One one example I was one example I was going going to go into more um in a more manga end of things since since the designs for Dominion are very much straddling that that particular line, especially with you mm-hmm. wanting to put in mechs. Um, <laughs> yeah, of course. I love are you them. are you familiar with Helsing? I've heard of him. I haven't read much of Helsing yeah. though. Um, Alucard is very much an overpowered character. Mm-hmm. Um, especially, especially, especially given who he actually is. But, and I will, I, I will admit, I'm getting, I'm getting kind of, I'm getting kind of spoilery. But there, but um, the thing that ends up making him work is his, is his methodology. One, his dis, his disdain for all kinds of monsters, especially um, vampires that he sees as ben- that he sees as beneath him, more so the ones that were created artificially, mm-hmm. because of the fact that he, his one moment of weakness caused him to become a monster, and he and when he and he utterly despises that that bit of weakness because for all of the mm-hmm. power that he ended up gaining, mm-hmm. he ha- he internally is hollow. Yeah. And he, yeah. he makes very clear that he does not want to be defeated by another monster. He wants to be defeated mm-hmm. by a human, mm-hmm. which is why he has so much respect for um, for the for the Helsing family because, well, Abraham Van Helsing was a human and beat him. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. But see, and that's and that's my opinion of a good story. You know, um, I have uh, I've created a couple of uh, comic book. Mm-hmm. classes uh developing cla- development classes mm-hmm. uh on the university level yeah and one of the things that i teach in the writing is that um your uh, protagonist in order to to make him a really really good protagonist you got to give him some type of limitation or quirk and what you just said about uh uh the main character in helsing mm-hmm. it, it it's that very thing it's like he despises monsters. That, that's his quirk. You know what I'm saying? And it makes him interesting. And it gives him this kind of, uh, you know what his response will be when he sees a monster. Yeah. Or you know what his response will be if he's, if, if he's you know, up against fighting, you know, a human. Yeah. So that's the thing. And that's what I like. It's like that thing you know that internally you know you've written into the character and you've expressed in the dialogue Mm -hmm. that when it when when your your viewer is watching you don't have to restate that you already know yeah you know what i'm saying um uh uh, indiana jones he hates snakes you know what i'm saying i mean he can't stand snakes so guess Mm -hmm. what you throw him in a pit of snakes (laughs) yeah and of course of course that that's just the case of making sure that Chekhov's gun doesn't misfire but I mm-hmm. think an all excellent case in point to 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 full to go full circle with Alucard, mm-hmm. his longtime rival because because there's there's a bit of a theme of um the of conflict between the Protestant Church and the Vatican mm-hmm. was Paladin Alexander Anderson, mm-hmm. who was who was basically the trump card for the for the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. In what in one of their fights later on, he ends up he ends up using a weapon that effectively turns him into what Alucard referred to as one of God's monsters. It's mm-hmm. basically Helena's nail. Mm-hmm. And when he when Anderson used it on himself, that was one of the rare moments where Alucard lost his cool because he it's clear that he genuinely wanted Anderson to be the one to beat him because for all mm-hmm. of his powers and even with being able to rege- regenerate wounds, he was still human. Yeah. But when he used the nail, even if it was a blessed item, he still lost his humanity. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I love that stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it, it makes it makes stories interesting. Yeah. And and complex, and that's why in Dominion, you know, I I, I try to. You know, I do character profiles, yeah. so I will I will look at Saul the way he was originally intended, mm-hmm. and then I will do it, my Dominion character profile because he's not the same. 
it's not the same person. This is yeah. a this is a this is a character now. He he's now brought into the realm of fiction. Mm -hmm. So now I can actually tweak it. And so then I'll add quirks and I'll add things that, you know, can make him seem much more relatable. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not a whole lot written in in, in the in the biblical text or even in the historical text about Saul outside of the achievements he he did or did not do. You know what I'm saying? Just like if you look at um, uh, uh, an Egyptian hieroglyph, you know, you can look at that and you, but you can see all of the things that Ramesses did, but you can't, you don't know him as a character. You just know his achievements. Mm -hmm. And so that's the thing, you know, and you know, maybe there are a couple of, you know, uh, dialogue texts that that's written in the Bible about Saul that can insinuate some, some more of his character, but you don't know him. And yeah. so, so I had to kind of fill in the blanks. I had to do that same thing with his son Jonathan. His his the Queen Ahinoam, it, she's only two, maybe two references in the scripture, and they're very, you know, just random saying, Oh, her father was blah blah blah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that's it. So I had to construct a whole character from her. And then the same thing with Michael. She she has more a little bit more written about her, but you know, a lot of that is artistic license for me. Mm-hmm. And now, since you brought up King, since you brought up Ramesses, I will I will make this note. As as much as I'm gonna as much as I'm gonna catch hell for this, Prince of Egypt is better than the Ten Commandments. Yes, no, no, you will not. You won't because a lot of people agree with you. A lot of people agree because with you. I'm, that I'm is, among that is a classic case of of what you mentioned of 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 take of taking that kind of figure and making them a character because. Yeah, Ramesses, in both cases, is the villain. But in the Ten Commandments, he's ve he's very much the he's very much a a dragon, as I mentioned before. Yeah, totally. Whereas in um in in uh, the Prince of Egypt, he's Moses' brother for all yes. for all intents, and well, and he and because and because of that, it it makes things all the more complicated with the two of them being on opposite ends because yeah. they do they see they still see each other as brothers. Yeah. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. But because of the paths that have been chosen for them, they can they cannot be as close anymore and he misinterprets it. That's that's why the best right. song in that in that movie is Let My People Go. Yeah. Do you think Moses had any at least in the movie, do you think he took any pleasure out of condemning Ramesses in Egypt. No. I mean, he he was very remorseful about that. He didn't want to condemn them. He wanted Ramesses to listen to him mm -hmm. and to take him seriously. But he, but you know, Ramesses, just like Saul, you you have your pride and your hubris that gets in the way of your of your humanity. And so that's why Ramesses is like, okay, well, they're going to have to make brick without straw. <laughs> and it's like, oh, man. Thanks, Moses. <laughs> um, but, but no, I, I, do, I, don't th I don't think that I don't think that's the case at all in, in, any, um, sh in any shape. Um, mm -hmm. And it's... The, and um, that that was the re that's the reason why that why, and I'm not I'm not going to say the Prince of Egypt is per is perfect. Some of some of the no, some of the mu good. some of the musical parts of it defi definitely um, definitely were grinding in were grinding into my ears. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But but um, I can forgive a lot when it com when it mm -hmm. comes to a story and having having a strong the if you give me a strong enough theme, I can cut you a little slack. Yeah, totally. Um, now, when I come now, one thing that I did notice is that, of course, on your social media, you've been posting s some images of what some of the um, Philistine warriors will will look like, and mm -hmm. I'm curious why why you what was your reasoning for going with a more um, li for going with a more lizard like approach with them. Um, part of it is um, I wanted to draw a clear distinction between the the protagonist and the antagonist. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and no better and clearer distinction is that you can see in the animal kingdom is fur and scale. Those are those are polar opposites. Fur, scale. So and of course, I mean, you know, birds kind of be kind of like a hybrid, but you know, they're more you know on the on the mammal side than they are on the reptile side. Yeah, or the amphibians. And so that to me was like, okay, this is a clear dichotomy. There, there is no, um, you know, gray area in this. Okay, so uh, that that was number one. Number two, um, it was an opportunity for me to make alien monsters out of these characters because this is a this is a, a sci fantasy. Mm -hmm. But even though I'm using um, uh, uh, mammals and and reptiles and amphibians. Um, I can actually create uh, in their character design whatever I want, and so you know the the um, uh, the Philistines they're they're crocodiles mostly, mm -hmm. uh, at, at least the fighter the fighting class are the the soldiers, uh, and so they look fearsome. They have these teeth, and then they have just like their you know just bumpy. Um, uh, you know, skin and, and just really just, just rough looking exterior. And then on top of that, I placed the fact that their, op their armor is, and their, you know, their, their weapons are much more archaic than the Dominion. Uh, if anything, their, their weapons are kind of hodgepodge. And so, but they have more kind of armor and their armor is very sharp and angular, and it's like any 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 contact you could probably get cut or or stabbed. That's mm -hmm. that's the the type of armor that they have. It's just very very um, uh, menacing, and that's really what I wanted them to look like. I wanted them to look very extremely menacing. When you see them on the battlefield, you know you got to come correct. Mm -hmm. And. And of course, and I, because of the because of the fact that you mentioned them as classes, I'm, I'm guess I'm guessing that one of the th that one of the things that you designed with them is, um, f is fighting with fighting with strength in numbers. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, with um with the the Philistines, um, the the only edge that they can have on the Dominion is their numbers. Because, you know, I mean, Dominion is more egalitarian. So, of course, you have an option to fight. With the Philistines, everybody fights. It doesn't matter. And so they can outnumber the Dominion uh, military might, uh, even though, you know, chances are, I mean, it's more evenly balanced because of the fact that they have the numbers. If they didn't have the numbers, if it was more a parody, then there would, there would be no... Uh, there would be no chance for them to win. But because they have the numbers, they can overwhelm any Dominion regiment, even even when the Dominion re regiment's weapons are much more powerful. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yes. Yeah, and I think as a I think as a as a case in point when it comes to that, the gen I remember the um generals discussing that the Philistines don't ha wouldn't have the technology to to make something like um Goliath and yeah, that of course betrays a um a mis a misunderstanding of how con of how conflicts work, and that um having it like we since since Star Wars has been brought up frequently, let, let's 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 consider that the mm -hmm. em the Empire has a tech is going to have a technological edge. Yes, but um. The, but that, but a tech, but that technological edge does not necessarily guarantee um, success. Well, you could see. I mean, they're mm -hmm. they got their butts handed to them. <laughs> well, that uh, I get. I guess the um. I guess the that ultimate was example destroyed. of this of this kind of thing is the is the ATATs. Yeah, and how and how um, because of the fact that they can't that shooting at them is doesn't do any good. Tripping them mm -hmm. up. A very with a very simple method of just of just using to, just using tow cables and grapplers yeah. Yeah. ends up doing the job. Yeah, it makes you have to think. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It makes you have to uh, you know have a an asymmetric type of approach to war. Yeah, 
because you you can't out you can't you're not as powerful you can't outclass them so you have to use uh, your your brain to try to figure out okay well what is a better way for me to to do this this is exactly what what the philistines do the philistines uh they they are the big dog mm -hmm. if there's two dogs in the fight the philistine is the big dog even a little bit bigger than dominion if anything um you know a, a backstory a little bit is the philistines they they basically were rulers over dominion at one point in time until of course dominion you know fought back or the the the, the citizens you know kind of rose up and then they basically took took control and then kicked them out and back to their own borders yeah um but uh but uh you know since since that happened over hundreds of years you know everybody is in is in parity in their own way the philistines have numbers on their side they do mm -hmm. you know and you know they just they they know how to make babies a lot quicker <laughs> <laughs> a uh, lot quicker <laughs> that's all I'd make an egg joke, but that's a, but that would be a little bit too um, obvious. Yeah. <laughs> now, 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 if I'm now if I'm not mistaken, you've got you've got it's you your um volume two is cur is currently in er is currently in early production. Yeah. Um, cur yeah. Now what now um first off, what are you shooting for as far as the page count? You know, volume two is probably going to be a little longer um, because I, I I really want to, volume two is going to be the space opera that I've been advertising. It mm -hmm. is. It's going to be this battle in space. Uh, that means there's going to be, you know, two page spread of war, which is something I'm very excited about as we're developing the script. Um, there will be a lot of, you know, kind of ship to ship action and battle cruisers and all this other stuff so it's going to be bigger i have um uh, uh, a parallel story that i'm telling that is telling the story of jonathan um he's going to basically pick up on what he was telling his mom about how his dad tried to kill him and so this is going to be the flashback of the battle and the aftermath where saul tried to kill jonathan and then um the second, the B story is going to be the story of Michael and how Michael basically commandeers uh, a a, um, a decommissioned mech, Seraphim mech, mm -hmm. and goes to the to the frontier and the and the countryside border worlds of Dominion to really kind of keep the peace because you know it's crumbling at the edges mm -hmm. as Saul kind of spirals into madness. Um, the kingdom is is becoming weakened, and so she's basically trying to keep the peace as much as she can. So we're telling both of those. It's like an A story and a B story. Mm -hmm. Well, probably mm, I'm thinking maybe thirty six pages. All right. And I re I realize that everything is always in flux when you've got so many moving parts. But mm -hmm. what are you shooting for as far as a release time? We're trying, uh, I don't know if we're going to meet, meet, meet this, but I really hope before Christmas, I mean, like the, maybe like a week before Christmas, mm -hmm. if we don't meet that, uh, at least for a digital release, it will definitely be maybe like uh, the first couple of weeks of January. Uh, when, when, whenever, when everybody up here is still frozen. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're we're uh, we just actually uh, uh, got uh, our Comicsology up, mm -hmm. so Dominion is now on officially on Comicsology. If any, if anybody wants to to find it, just put in Dominion Fall of the House of Saul in Comicsology. Uh, yeah, and then of course on our website at www.terminusmedia.com. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'll put I'll put that in the in the description. Um, mm -hmm. But with with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to come back up to the temple and enjoy the insanity at play. This is this is always so fun for me. So you know, I will be back most definitely. As a matter of fact, um, in in um, uh, November, we're going to be doing uh, an Indiegogo campaign uh, for book two. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, we're actually going to be offering, we have the uh, these um, uh, 12 inch uh, figurines that we're going to be offering for uh, the Seraphim mech. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that right there, uh, it, we're having it 3D modeled right now. And uh, yeah, that's going to be a nice one. <laughs> so uh, I've been geeking out over and I'm like, yes, yes, finally we can do some stuff like that. So we're putting that together right now. But yeah, it, uh, in um, in uh, November, probably probably beginning in November, we're going to launch that. All right. And I'll, like I said, I'll definitely be looking forward to that. Um and of, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gimming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs> <laughs>